So at the end of the video on the Russian circular warships, I mentioned there was one more ship, the last of their kind. Today, it's time to take a look at that rather unique vessel. The Livadia was built as the official royal yacht of the House of Romanov, the rulers of the Russian Empire. They found themselves in need of a new yacht, as the last one, also called Livadia, had suffered a terminal existence failure off the coast of Crimea in the Black Sea. Since the yacht was intended mainly for Black Sea use, and the two circular warships of Admiral Popov's design were at the time radical and new, he was given the job of building the new yacht, after he objected very strongly to what would essentially have been a slightly upgraded copy of the old vessel. And of course, he immediately aimed to turn it into a continuation of his theme of circular or near-circular vessels. Although, given some of the workmanship issues that had been encountered with Novgorod and Popov, he decided to go with a British shipyard on the Clyde for this particular one. And with money being no object, but a premium being placed on speed, the shipyard's owner promptly took to towing a large model of the ship around a Scottish lock in order to try and work out the best placement for the ship's screws and how much power he would need to get the desired speed of 15 knots. Due to this desire for a speed that was significantly greater than the relatively slow pace of the more circular warships, since the Russian royal family did desire to progress across the ocean at something a little bit faster than the speed of a brisk walk, a few sacrifices would have to be made. Primarily, the near-circular design that Popov favoured previously. His new design, therefore, was a little bit more ovoid than circular, but still very definitely a product of Admiral Popov rather than any conventional designer. Whereas ships of the period went for between a 4 to 1 to 7 to 1 length to beam ratio, depending on their use, the 72 meter long by 47 meter wide hull of the new ship was around 1.5 to 1, with a hull profile that looked a bit like a frisbee, with an overly fat normal yacht stuck on top, and a perfectly flat underside. Engines that generated just over 10,000 horsepower from three boilers, drove three screws for a top operational speed of 14 knots. This was a slightly inefficient power-to-speed ratio, given the standards of the day, but the speed was still more than twice as fast as Novgorod and Popov, although at absolute full power she managed to hit almost 16 knots whilst developing an additional 2,000 horsepower to her nominal rated amount. Like her predecessors, she was exceptionally agile and very well suited to navigating tight waterways, and due to her unusually wide hull, the funnels were arranged in line abreast across it, rather than fore to aft as in a conventional ship. To make especially sure that the royal family didn't end up as fish food, the lower part of the hull was subdivided into no less than 40 separate watertight compartments, four of them holding the power plant and the associated machinery, whilst the rest held coal, which further increased resistance to flooding and improved the buoyancy in the event of a breach. The upper hull was also heavily subdivided for strength and additional resistance to flooding, and had a pronounced tumble home. This is where the hull becomes narrower quite rapidly the higher up you go. She was also something of a novelty in being fully electrically lit inside, which was quite the advancement for the time, although this was accomplished by a variety of devices that were all variants on the theme of electrical arc lighting, which was not necessarily the safest choice for something that was near a large body of water, and indeed would rapidly proved to be rather unsafe for humans, since these particular light bulbs were the kind that could kill you for improperly adjusting them. The ship, nevertheless, would be launched in July 1880, to the joy of some and the suspicion of others, the latter including many countries who suspected that this was a testbed for, the, for a more ocean-going variant of Popov's warships. Suspicion aside, people flocked to see this unusual ship and its interior, which, thanks to its dimensions, 
and the length to width ratio was incredibly spacious. And given that it was the yacht of the Russian royal family, it was also exceptionally well decorated and lavishly appointed, like a small floating palace. By September, the ship was on acceptance trials and soon on her way to Russia under the command of a captain who had had previous experience in Novgorod and Popov, the other two circular warships. As the ship was destined for the Black Sea, this meant sailing across the Channel, down south along the French and Spanish coasts, and then through the Mediterranean. However, whilst heading across the Bay of Biscay, the ship ran into a rather large storm, where her design showed both good and bad points. On the plus side, 20-foot waves barely troubled the ship, and indeed the pancake nature of the hull meant that it barely even tilted or listed. This showed great promise for the use of such a design as a warship, since a vessel to this specification would be able to accurately aim and fire its guns in what appeared to be even the highest of seas. On the downside, this stability was came at a price, and that was that the hull tended not so much to run up or through the waves, but rather straight into them, in roughly the same way a car without any working suspension hits a road hump, with a massive bang. The crew was right to be nervous, as these thunderous impacts managed to crack the lower hull within the space of a day, and only the massive compartmentalisation of the ship allowed it to reach a safe harbour, rather putting on hold pancake warships, since ships that sink themselves are not really welcome until the invention of the proper submarine. Divers inspected the ship and found a big dent and many, many small cracks, along with a few missing pieces of plating. And upon review of the design, it was realised that the ship had been built with all the main beams radiating from the centre, a bit like a flower. This did make the core of the ship exceptionally strong, but it also meant the spacing between the beams was widest on the outer edges, including the bow, making these the weakest part of the ship, even though they would be subjected to the greatest force of water. Whilst repairs themselves would have been fairly easy, her width meant that there was no existing dry dock that she would actually fit into. Instead, after seven months of slow repairs in Ferrol in Spain, where she became something of the local attraction, and her status as a royal yacht was greatly enhanced by the number of lavish parties and entertainments thrown by her noble guests, she would gingerly make her way back across the Mediterranean, across the Black Sea, and into port, avoiding any further confrontations with the power of nature. Although she handled well in calm seas, her role as a royal yacht came to an end before it had properly began, as Tsar Alexander II, who had ordered the ship, was assassinated in March 1881, shortly after the arrival of the Livadia back in Russian waters, and his successor, Alexander III, was therefore left with more pressing matters to worry himself about, and that didn't involve a rather odd yacht hundreds of miles away in a relatively quiet part of the Russian Empire. And how often can you say that about that particular region? By the end of the year, therefore, after a small bit of ferry duty for lesser royals, which unfortunately ran into another storm, rather disconcerting the passengers, she was stripped of her fine interior, and after a number of ideas were discarded for future use, which included a mobile prison and a troop ship, the latter of which actually had a fair degree of merit to it, she was instead renamed to the experiment and converted into a floating barracks and warehouse, with her power plant being split out across a number of other Russian warships. She would remain in this role until at least the late 1920s, when she would finally be sold for scrap, and at some point between the late 1920s and the early 1930s, she would actually be disassembled, since the poor owner of the ship, who had acquired it during the sale, came across the same problem that the Russian royal family had faced when it had been damaged in Farol, namely a lack of a dry dock suitable to take it, 
and so rather than a quick disassembly the ship's hulking outline would be seen in port for a number of years as it was gradually taken apart in place piece by piece that's it for this video thanks for watching if you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review let us know in the comments below don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions